Good afternoon, everyone. This is Monica David. Um, I want to thank you all for joining. Looks like we have uh, quite a few folks on. My audio is on. I do have 1.30. I want to thank you for coming on such a beautiful, beautiful day. Wouldn't we all rather be outside? Um, I'll leave my video on for just a minute so that you can see who I am, but I'm the uh, an extension spe specialist and the Illinois Master Gardener Coordinator. And we're going to be talking today about abiotic plant problems on landscape plants. You should have received two handouts. Uh, one handout is a copy of the slides and the other one is my Quickie Symptom Guide for Diagnosing Abiotic Disorders. Uh, the original one that uh, Martha Smith ha uh, sent out, I believe, had a broken URL. So I sent a new one out, and I will resend that out as well. So I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, with the talk. Um, I'll stop periodically and uh, ask questions or open it up to questions. You can put things in the chat box or open up your mic and talk. But I will stop periodically through the talk. Okay. Um, Alrighty, let's get started. The diagnostic challenge. Um, Diagnosing plant diseases can be very difficult, I'll be honest with you. Um, I've been doing it a long time, as have many of the educators, and it's always a challenge. Uh, landscapes are tremendously variable uh, from one end of the state to the other, from one end of the county to the other, and one end of your landscape to the other side. We have different soil sites, conditions, plant species, so oftentimes, diagnosing diseases can be really a puzzle. Um, many landscapes have hundreds of different species planted, so knowing what can go wrong with everything is a challenge. And I think the biggest challenge when we're doing diagnosis is that we'd like to put things in a box and say, OK, I have a diagnosis for this. It's an insect problem. Or I have a diagnosis for this. It's an environmental problem. But unfortunately, there's always a, or very often, a lot of interaction of both biotic and abiotic factors. And by the time your plant is dying, it's often too late to correct the problem. So we're going to talk today about biotic um, causes of problems, but let's, let's do a little definition here to start with. So what is biotic versus abiotic? Well, biotic means that it's a problem or a disease that's caused by a pathogen. So here we're talking about insects, bacteria, fungi, nematodes, viruses. We're going to focus on abiotic uh, causes of disease today. And this, this is something that's caused by a non-living agent. And you can see in my picture here on the right, uh, that's obviously abiotic, and it's certainly drought. If we compare biotic to abiotic, we can see that biotic means that there might be insect or disease signs present. So when we're actually diagnosing or trying to figure out what our problem is, we want to look and see if we have any disease signs there. We want to see if we have evidence of the insect itself. Is there webbing from the insect? Is there fungal mycelium? So we want to look for those signs. In biotic um, diseases, the injury is usually spread progressively on the plant, which means that, let's say it's, if it's a fungal disease, the fungi will come in, they'll attack a small area, they'll spread throughout the plant, um, and then they can spread to nearby plants as well. When we look at diseases and insects, they're often species limited. Sometimes when we look at abiotic diseases like salt damage, salt damage can occur to a wide range of plants. But in the case of biotic diseases, um, an insect or a disease may be very specific in the host that it attacks. For example, um, uh, emerald ash borer has a very specific host. 
and uh, Dutch elm disease has a very specific host, elms. That's not always the case in abiotic diseases. If we look at abiotic diseases or non-infectious diseases, we won't find a sign of the pathogen present. It usually does not develop progressively, and it usually does not move plant to plant. And I'll explain a little bit more about this as we go along. Abiotic causes may affect numerous plant species within a planting. So this is a good indication when you're doing diagnosis as well. And then lastly, very often we can see a clear zone where the abiotic disease has caused a problem and then we have non-infected tissue. Now actually, abiotic disease is more common than infectious disease. You know when we talk, when we do our uh, Master Gardener basic training, we talk an awful lot of, of time about infectious diseases. But really, abiotic diseases are more common in the landscape, but they're often harder to diagnose. And remember that environmental problems, drought, um, flooding, may predispose plants to invasion by pathogens. So when you're doing your um, CSI, when you're trying to figure out what's wrong with your plant, consider biotic first. Consider that it may be a pathogen. Look for the causal agent to confirm the infectious disease. And if you can't find it, then you might consider abiotic. So we're going to talk about five different categories of abiotic disease today. And we'll go through each one of those, and I'll give you some examples on that. But first, let's re regress a little bit and talk about our step-by-step -step diagnosis. And this is something we go over in Master Gardener training, but it never hurts to renew um, or review this. First of all, we need to identify the plant. We need to know whether we're working with an oak or a maple, for example. We need to identify the signs and symptoms. Again, the signs are the presence of the pathogen. It may be the insect itself. It may be insect frass. We might see um, fungal mycelium. We want to see if we can find evidence of the pathogen. Then we also want to look for the symptoms. The symptoms are how the plant expresses that a disease is present. So we might look for wilting. We might look for yellowing. We want to inspect the whole plant. Where on the plant are these symptoms occurring? Is it only on the leaves? Is it the leaves, the stems? Is it on the roots? We also want to inspect the site. What is the drainage like? What is the terrain like? What is the irrigation or lack of irrigation like? Is the plant planted in shade or sun? So we want to look at all those things. We also want to look for patterns. Is the problem uniform over the whole plant? Is it scattered? It's Is it on. only on the young growth? So we want to note that as well. We want to look at the history of the plant, how they were planted, what about construction, what about fertilization, what about salt use, what about too much mulch, all of those things. Um, we need to know. And then once we have all of this information, we can look at the most common or the most likely situation or agent that could be causing the problems. So let's go ahead and look at specific abiotic disorders. Okay, the first one is the biological or botanical uh, category. And uh, the first one I wanted to mention is genetic mutations. Um, oftentimes, genetic mutations are a fact of nature, and there's really not too much we can do about it. Um, sometimes you will have albino seedlings, and they will die off. And, but sometimes the mutants are stable, and they sustain growth. Sometimes these mutants are used to develop new cultivars with unique form, foliage, stem characteristics, etc. We also have something called the chimera, which is a single plant with two genetically different tissue types. And leaf variegations are the most common. 
These have spawned some of our variegated plants that we're using quite typically in our landscapes today. But some others are not stable and could produce cell mutations. So that's genetic mutations. Here's an interesting genetic mutation, and this is called genetic reversion. This happens quite frequently in dwarf Alberta spruce. Um, and dwarf Alberta spruce has a tendency to revert back to its uh, normal species, which is white spruce. About 20% of the dwarf Alberta spruces which are planted will revert back to the um, normal form of the white spruce. So what do you do if you see this condition in your landscape? Well, the suggestions are that you prune it out quickly and completely. Um, in this particular picture on this slide, I, I seriously doubt that uh, there's much time left. Uh, this should have been pruned out when the, the uh, mutation or the reversion was first found. We also have graft incompatibility. This is due to the failure of the bud or the graft union between the scion and the rootstock. Uh, this will disrupt the phloem and the xylem. Um, and this can actually lead to um, an increase uh, buildup of the sugars. And so oftentimes you will see intensified fall color. Uh, graft incompatibility is quite frequently found in fruit production. Not frequently, but more commonly seen in fruit production than any other type. Um, it can cause uh, trees like this to snap off in a storm. It's often a weak, weak graft. Um, the plants or the trees may show stunting or chlorosis, premature leaf drop, decline in vigor, suckering, and can kill the plants. So then you'll just kind of watch. And, in, and right. in most cases, what you would do with something like this, this is a pretty severe graft incompatibility, is simply to remove the tree. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm going to take a drink. Okay, um, let me stop there and see if there are any questions so far before we go on to talk about all the environmental problems that cause, or the environmental conditions that cause problems. <clears throat> so I'll hold on for just a minute. Okay, I'll turn off my video. Thank you, Tom. So feel free to type in the chat box, or if you'd like to open your mic and talk, that's fine as well. I'll take questions either way. OK, I don't see anyone typing, so I'm going to go on. Please, if you think of a question, go ahead and, and type it in the chat box. I'll take a little longer break after I go through this environmental section because obviously environmental causes of abiotic disease are probably the most common thing that we encounter in our landscape. For gosh sakes, we live in Illinois. Um, one, one year it's we have a terrible winter, then we have drought, then we have flooding. So our poor trees and shrubs and plants have to uh, to live through these um, unfortunate conditions. So we're going to talk about some of the environmental conditions which are causing abiotic disease on our plants. The first one is sun scald. And this is actually damage to the bark caused by rapid temperature fluctuations in the winter. For example, um, if you have a warm, sunny winter day, it can warm the stem tissue 
and it starts to thaw some of the internal cell uh, moisture on the stem and the trunk and then the sun will set the temperatures will drop um, rapidly and in this case then that water that is thawed because of the nice sunlight um, starts to freeze and it ruptures um, internal tissues and that's what you see in the picture I have shown you here on the left and in sun skull the cambium the xylem and the phloem are often damaged giving a sunken looking area which is what we see on that particular tree there it's often found on the south or the southwest side on water stress trees and on thin bark trees as well now certain uh, types of trees are susceptible to sun scald. I have a huge list here. I'll give you some, but the list is pretty long. <clears throat> Tulip trees, maples, lindens, and a lot of our fruit trees are susceptible to sun scald. Oftentimes in the fruit orchard, they will paint the tree trunks with a mixture of white latex paint, and you may have seen this. They are trying to um, prevent the sun scald. In frost cracking, we get a very similar scenario where um, the internal parts are freezing. But in this case, as you can see in the right-hand photo, we're actually getting cracks in the bark or splits, in vertical splits in the bark. Now, sunburn is something that's a little different. And sunburn is an injury to above ground parts of the plant. This could be leaves, bark, flowers, fruit. Here we see uh, green peppers. Um, and this is caused by excessive exposure to solar radiation. So high ambient temperatures are related to the injury. And if you're in a drought or have a water deficit, that will add to the problem. Unlike sun scald, Sunburn is not related to freezing temperatures. When you have this on your plants, your leaves are going to become discolored, necrotic. Um, the bark can become dry, cracked, split. And the flowers or the fruits often look water soaked. And this is what you see here in this picture of the green peppers. This condition often happens in the spring. Um, during high temperatures, if you have a cool spring and then the temperatures warm up real rapidly, sometimes we can see the sunburn. The sensitive species to sunburn are oftentimes those plants that are planted on the very edge of their zone, so or less than optimal growing conditions. Okay, let's talk about low temperature. We had some problems with this in the past winter. Um, we can either have two types. We can have chilling injury or we can have freezing injury. Now, if the injury is below, comes from temperatures below 32 degrees, it's obviously going to be frost or freezing injury. If it's an injury above 32 degrees, we call that a chilling injury. Um, the chilling injury actually happens when there's a very sudden drop in temperature during an active period of growth. So maybe in the spring, the plant is actively growing and then all of a sudden it drops down to 20 degrees. And this can damage new shoots, um, damages the apical or terminal meristem, and can cause death of the shoot as well. Call button. Is the phone sound? No, you press the... You, so you make sure you have your mute on. We also have frost or freezing injury. And this is when ice forms in the vessels of the plant again, causing dehydration and disruption or rupture of membranes and cells. Uh, this is what has happened in these two shots where it's actually caused a brown discoloration or a bleaching look. Um, the severity of this uh, frost or freezing injury depends upon the plant's um, hardiness, what's affected, what the temperatures are, etc. If the plant uh, develops too much uh, bud death or cambium death, it can kill the plants. 
Here is, here is some more winter injury. Uh, it's Armeria on the left, where it was the plants uh, were sitting in a very wet area over the winter, and this caused winter injury. On the right is forget-me-nots, and they were under winter moisture stress, which actually uh, contributed to their winter injury. This is one of my favorites, I guess you could say. I love this slide, called Winter Desiccation. This is actually damage. Uh, it's a result of the interaction of temperature and wind. It's actually kind of sort of like drought stress. And it occurs when the water absorption by the roots cannot replace the water lost in the leaves or the needles. The soil may be frozen. The roots can't absorb the water and replace the needed water. In the slide on the right, you can see that there uh, is actually an area about, oh, a quarter of way up where the plant is green below and brown above. And this is where the snow line was when this occurred. So the snow was protecting those lower branches from the winter desiccation, but everything above um, was affected. This often occurs on bright, sunny, really cold days in the winter. It's most common on evergreens, so we see this quite typically on pines and spruce. Um, so there are some things we can do. We can wrap or screen our plants, our evergreens. Um, there are anti-transpirants uh, mixed reviews on that, uh, but that is a possibility. Okay, staying on environmental, there are uh, water stress or drought, and we certainly saw this a uh, couple of years ago, and we are still seeing the results of the drought stress and the water stress from several years ago. Um, now, the level of injury depends upon the severity and the length of the water deficit. We can separate it into two groups again. We have those that have acute water stress, and we have those that have chronic water stress. The acute occurs over a very short period of time, and so the wilting is usually severe, and this is acute uh, water stress that we see here. This is squash. Um, if this continues, it can develop into chronic stress, and um, it will actually, the tissues, the leaves, etc., will actually die and become necrotic. We can often start to see a tip burn on the margins of the leaves, um, zones. Sometimes you can actually see zones of dehydration in the leaves. Often the leaves will turn a reddish brown with distinct borders between the hydrated and non hydrated tissues. And I'll show you a little better slide of that. Uh, here in just a moment. Here's water stress on um, a stilby on the left. You can see the brown crinkly edges of the leaves. That's due to water stress. And that is Aramis on the right, which is also showing browning of the leaves due to water stress. Now, this is uh, water stress and drought. Uh, this is chronic water deficit, and we have all seen this in the landscape. Um, it's very difficult to identify. It can resemble some um, other problems. And I guess I should mention, I forgot to mention, I did, as part of your handouts, you should have gotten a symptom guide. I put this together because I, I like it. It's a quick and dirty um, guide for if you have a particular symptom. So if, for example, your plant is wilting, there could be many causes for it. And I have listed those positive possible causes on, in the right-hand side of that chart. So if you have a plant that's wilting, you could consider water deficit, maybe poor drainage, root damage, etc. So this gives you a little help in your diagnosis. When we have plants with chronic water deficit, um, we see things like reduced leaf size. Um, the leaf color in the fall is less intense. Early leaf drop, 
I think we've seen that in a lot of trees. I have in the landscapes in July, the leaves are small. They're turning red. They're starting to drop, which is always a, a signal or an indication to me that, yes, maybe there's a root problem, maybe a water stress problem. We see scorch, browning of the leaves, branch dieback, branch cracks. All of those can occur in extreme um, drought. And unfortunately, one of the worst things that happens here is that the plants that are stressed like this then have low pest resistance and they may be attacked by um, insects like a bark beetle or a pathogen. Now the slide on the right does an actually a very good job of showing you, this is drought on this maple as well, of showing you that clear line of demarcation where you can see the, the scorched or dried up tissue on the outside and on the tips and then the green, uh, the green leaf tissue in the middle. Here's more water stress and drought. Uh, factors which actually influence drought are, of course, below average rainfall, lack of or poor irrigation, and things like compacted soil, slopes, hardscapes, etc. Wind, temperature, humidity, root injury, all of those things um, influence water stress and drought. Now, some plants are more tolerant of water stress, um, and some are less tolerant. Um, species that are high water users, like maple, horse chestnut, hydrangea, ferns, those tend to have um, um, more rapid signs or damage from water stress. And of course, we know certain um, preventative things we can do, mulch, watering, um, and of course, the right plant in the right place. Okay, as I mentioned, here we are in Illinois. So if we don't have, um, have drought, we have flooding, right? We have one or the other, it seems. Um, so excess water can be a huge problem in Illinois as well. If you live in a high floodplain area near a river, near a lake, uh, flooding actually reduces the oxygen supply and limits the root function. Acute flooding, which is ours today's, you see wilting, extreme wilting again, excessive leaf drop, uh, the leaves appear discolored and water soaked, and of course roots that have acute uh, flooding are often very susceptible to root rots. Now, chronic flooding, which is flooding that has occurred like this picture, which obviously this didn't happen yesterday, but uh, chronic flooding, which is weeks to months, you really see the whole plant start to suffer. The plant's going to slow down its growth. It's not getting oxygen. The leaves are going to be small. Um, the leaves are going to be chlorotic or yellow, and you see early fall coloring. So we obviously have plants that are more tolerant to flooding conditions, something like a um, alder or a birch or an ash or a willow or a bald cypress. So if you have an area that you suspect um, may have some flooding issues, you would want to choose a plant that can tolerate um, more flooding. And what happens here is that they actually um, are more tolerant of low oxygen levels. Other types of trees are not flood tolerant. Um, the a lot of the maples like Norway and red maple, dogwood, hawthorn, I could go on and on with the lists. Now this is a condition called edema. It is an environmental condition. And we've all probably seen this on pumpkins. We're getting our pumpkins now, so we're used to it. And uh, this is the growth of these small raised corky outgrowths. You can see the pumpkin on the left, the plant on the right. Um, the damage is a 
is aesthetic though and it doesn't damage the plant health it's kind of ugly we don't like it we don't want our pumpkins to look that way but um, it really does not threaten plant health the cause is not uh, they don't completely know what causes this but they believe it may be due to excess moisture or high humidity Okay, staying on our theme of environmental or abiotic causes of problems, we have lightning. Um, we had uh, lightning strike the tree right next to our old plant clinic. Um, one day when they were working in the plant clinic, bang, lightning struck the tree nearby. Um, you can see that the lightning can actually fracture the wood or travel right down the trunk to the ground and it carves kind of this groove in the connective tissue. Um, sometimes the bark will hang in shreds. Actually, uh, I have never seen it, but they say that the force of the lightning can actually blow the soil off the roots. Um, an entire tree can actually burst into flame. Um, in some cases, the heat is greater than 25,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I've never seen one like that, so but uh, uh, that is possible. Um, when I was doing research for this talk, I found it very interesting that the trees at which are most susceptible to lightning damage are those that have a high starch content and are good conductors, which makes sense. But this is maple ash, tulip tree, spruce, pine, sycamore. Now the trees that have a high oil content within the trees actually have very low susceptibility to lightning damage. And this is birch, beech, and horse chestnut. Hail damage. Uh, the picture on the left on your screen this time is cabbage. And you can see the typical lesions for hail damage. They're C-shaped. Um, on the right, we have a tree with some twigs that were damaged by hail. Hail can actually break or shatter the twigs. It can bruise or scar the twigs or the bark. And uh, the hail wounds on a tree or shrub that has been hit the, they're actually elliptical in shape. Unfortunately, we know this causes a lot of damage, damage to the plants itself, but it also opens, I look at that and I think, mm, oh, this is opening this plant up to insect or pathogens, fungi, canker pathogens, etc. Snow or ice damage. So you can see that environmental is a big area of problems for um, trees, abiotic problems. This is snow or ice damage. And gee, on a nice day like today, I hate to look at this and think winter is coming, but oh, it is. So we see snow and ice accumulation on the branches, causing splitting, cracking, bark tearing, breakage. Um, you want to carefully remove the ice and snow. Um, and as we know, certain types of plants are susceptible to snow and ice damage. Uh, Bradford pears, that's one of the reason that Bradford's uh, went out of favor, but also birches. Uh, the river birches are, have such thin branches, they, they don't sustain a lot of ice weight. Okay, I'm going to stop again here and see if there are any questions before we go into the next group.
Are you awake out there? Anybody have any questions on environmental problems, biological, genetic abnormalities? Hey, Monica, this is Ava in Champagne. We have a question. Sure. I have uh, two Japanese maples that I think are suffering from sun scald. Uh -huh. So each uh, spring they leaf out just fine, but about midsummer, the south side of both of them start losing their leaves. And um, so I'm wondering if wrapping the uh, trunks will help that. Um, well, the, where are your um, your um, where are your Japanese maples planted in your landscape? Are they in an open area? Are they in a protected area? They're both close to my house. Um, they are on the west side, um, but one is closer to the southwest side of the of the house. So. I don't know if they're protect. I mean, no, I wouldn't say they're necessarily protected. Okay. Um, well, the thing about Japanese maples is that um, in some cases, uh, and you're in Champagne, obviously. I've seen Japanese maples. I I I believe that they're a little bit out of their element in Champagne, Urbana. Uh, number one, um, we had a really bad cold winter, and uh, they're not really happy with that. <laughs> I have seen some in Champagne that are huge trees um, that do very well, but they're just a little marginal here when we have a bad winter. So um, it's <laughs> always good when you're planting Japanese maples um, to um, put them in a protected spot. But yes, I think um, especially... I. From everything I've heard, we're supposed to, if you can go by the Farmer's Almanac, have a fairly mild winter. Yeah. But I think it would be a good idea to um, actually ra wrap them if you're worried about it and you think you've had sun scald in the past. Well, yeah, that's what I was told um, by, mm -hmm. by someone. And the trees are about 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And it's just happened in the last two years. So the other possibility, I think, is also the drought affecting them. So it might be a combination sure. of the two things. Absolutely. You're absolutely correct. And, we, and, you know, it's the swings in temperature that are so bad for our plants. You know, one day when it's 50 and the next day it's 15, mm -hmm. that just, yeah. that's just really bad. So, yeah. yeah. So, and then with the drought... Yeah, we've seen a lot of problems. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Macon says, should be we be watering our trees now? The answer is yes. You want to make sure that you give them a good watering, especially before the winter. Um, yes. So the answer, yes, we had uh, a wet spring, and now I think it's been, I think my husband told me, 32 days in Champaign since we've had any water. So yes. Yes, I, I'm especially watering my newer trees, um, not my old established ones as well, but if I have something five years or less, I've been watering them. I helped my daughter put in a new um, yard uh, about three years ago, and we have consistently watered um, the trees, and we are watering them this fall, and they look great. So. Okay. Um, Nancy says, Monica, does sun scald, frost cracking, or winter desiccation often lead to the death of trees? And the answer is, it depends. Yes, if it's severe enough, um, it will. And oftentimes what happens, especially with the cracking, is that it opens it up to other pathogens. So it may, be, it may not be the frost cracking that, that eventually kills the tree, but it might be the borers or something else that comes in. All right. Monica, this is uh, Onarga. Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, how would you tell the difference between a bacterial scorch and an environmental scorch? That's a wonderful question. 
Um, and it's very hard to do. <laughs> Um, there are some very minute, um, slight differences in the pattern on the leaves, but if uh, you are seeing a scorch and you suspect that uh, you might have a bacterial scorch, I would simply send a sample into the plant clinic. They will do testing on it um, and let you know. So it's it's very, very difficult to, to tell the difference. So I would send a sample into the plant clinic. Thank you. Besides wilting, uh, the question is, besides wilting, uh, what are the other signs that a tree is suffering from drought? Um, as I mentioned, that can be bleaching of the needles. Um, um, it's uh, especially if it's a chronic condition uh, the tree will have smaller than average leaves uh, will very often um, have um, early fall coloration as I mentioned that's one thing that is um, really a good sign to me they plant they just planted a bunch of uh, trees on uh, uh, in a new area of campus and uh, a couple years ago they haven't watered them and those things were coloring they they're definitely suffering from wilt they started coloring several of them are maples there's some oaks they started coloring in June and July so that's something to look for um, you can look for those patterns on the leaves as I mentioned where you have a kind of a dead brown area with a, a clear demarcation um, usually that's on the edge and then the, um, the other tissue may look nice and green. So those are the things to look for. Tip burn also. Any other questions on those? Or on any of the issues I covered? Okay, I'm going to go on and um, we'll talk about soil issues. Um, I'm going to talk just really briefly about nutrient deficiencies. Um, nutrient deficiencies rarely happen in most of our woody plants. They can be difficult to diagnose. Uh, they're dependent on soil types, site conditions, root absorption and the plant itself, so I'm just going to briefly touch on a couple of them for you. Um, this is nitrogen deficiency. Um, you can see the yellowing of the older leaves. Um, nitrogen is what we call a mobile element, meaning that it moves throughout the plant. Some of them, some of the elements, nitrogen, potassium, all of the elements, calcium, phosphorus, blah, 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 some are mobile, which means they move throughout the plants, and some of them are non-mobile. And when we have a mobile element like nitrogen, what will happen is as uh, when there is a deficiency, the nitrogen will move out of the older tissue and into the newer leaves. And that's what you can see. You can see yellowing of the older leaves. The young leaves retain their green color. If this occurs in a conifer, the needles are yellow and shorter, and um, so. But again, this could be so many things when you see this yellowing on the plant. And usually, to actually diagnose that something has a nitrogen deficiency, in most cases, it will take um, uh, leaf samples for concentration. You you could do a, a soil sample, but that may not be definitive. Sometimes it requires further testing. This is phosphorus and potassium, and they are both mobile elements. In phosphorus, um, the deficiency is going to show in the older leaves. The stems and leaves turn a really dark color. And then often what I look for when I'm looking for a phosphorus deficiency is purpling, especially in the veins. Um, but there are other things, again, that cause purpling. Um, when I go to get my tomatoes in the spring and it's been a cool season and I see purple leaved um, um, tomatoes, I think of two things and it's almost always cold damage. But uh, cold damage can cause that purpling in tomatoes, phosphorus as well. 
Potassium, um, again, is a mobile element, so it affects the older leaves. And here what we get is marginal and intervenal chlorosis. So we have yellowing that's going to occur on the margins or near the veins. Um, and then it usually causes the leaves to scorch and sometimes to die. But again, I'm showing you these, but I don't expect you to come away with being able to easily diagnose these. You're probably all familiar with calcium issues. And this, of course, is blossom end rot due to a calcium deficiency. This is on tomatoes. And it's usually related to uneven watering. We do have one pH problem that we do see uh, quite a bit in our landscapes, and that is an iron deficiency problem in plants like pin oak, sweet gum, birches, um, some pines. And this is actually due to a pH problem. Uh, most of our uh, home landscape soils tend to be alkaline. The form of the iron which is in the soil, because it's alkaline, is hard for the tree to absorb, hence it, it develops an iron deficiency. Um, there are some remedies. They don't always work well. Your tree can go from this um, chlorosis that you can see. You can see the chlorosis here. It's The veins are still green, but the rest of the leaf has turned yellow. Sometimes the leaves, if this advances, it will go to where they're very chlor uh, chlorotic uh, and necrotic. You will see brown spots. You can actually see the leaves die. This can kill the tree as well. Um, it's very difficult to change the soil pH. I know people have tried to add sulfur to the soil, um, but that's very difficult because of the buffering capacity of the soil. You can see in this adult pin oak, it would be next to impossible to change the soil pH by adding sulfur here. But there are iron chelates that can be sprayed on the uh, leaves. Uh, it's a short-lived solution, and they are non-mobile within the leaf. And there are also some trunk injections, which can be tried for iron deficiency. Okay, let's go on to some chemical problems, some chemical abiotic problems. Um, this, this is a slide I like as well. I wished I'd taken it, but I hadn't. But this shows salt pro, uh, problem. This is due to the de-icing or the road salt. And you can see, if you remember back when I started, where you actually can see that clear line of demarcation. You can see where the salt spray actually um, sprayed up on the lower parts of these U's. U's are very susceptible to salt damage. And then the, um, the sodium chloride or the calcium chloride is actually toxic to the buds and the tissues in the shrub or the plant, and so it kills it. It looks like a burn. So if you see the plant that looks burned, you might kind of consider salt damage. Um, you're going to get bronzing foliage on evergreens from salt damage. Uh, if it goes onto a ground cover, it can almost bleach the, uh, the foliage. Um, and it, if it is severe enough, it could kill the plant. Um, however, this is not going to be a condition that is going to be spread to use on the other side of this building. It's, it's definitely an abiotic condition. Here's some more salt problems. If you look at the uh, conifers are especially sensitive. Junipers, yews, pines, and spruce are extremely susceptible to salt problems. If you look at the, the picture on the left, you can actually see where, or imagine where the salt was placed on the driveway and splashed up into these junipers. And you can actually almost see a spray pattern. Um, and if you look at the slide on the right, you can see that those, I believe they're pines, um, that are right along the road are the ones that are affected. But if you look at the left side of the slide, you can see that the, the pines further in didn't get any spray salt, so they are fine. Um, now there are some less toxic alternatives, such as soy-based or 
calcium magnesium acetate. I don't believe they're widely used. They are more expensive. Okay, I'm going to mention um, just some chemical damage things here. But let me put uh, a statement here first. Uh, for And I know most of you are master gardeners, but master gardeners, we don't... Um, we don't identify um, herbicide drift cases. Those need to be sent or referred to your coordinator, educator. They are investigated by the Illinois Department of Ag. They can be a legal case. So if you suspect something looks like this and you suspect maybe it was an herbicide drift, then you need to turn it over to your coordinator or educator. But I like to show these because I want, I want you to see what they look like so that you can be aware if something ever comes in so that you can say, ah, this is what I punt, this is what I send on. So the herbicide damage varies with the plant and with the herbicide that is applied. Uh, some of the herbicides are absorbed through the roots and some go through the leaves and the stems. The main symptoms we see are root and shoot stunting, leaf yellowing, leaf death, leaf necrosis, spotting, and malformed shoots. Now there's three types of herbicides commonly used. One is the growth regulator, 2,4-D, such as 2,4-D. That usually causes leaf cupping, twisted, distorted growth. So, um, and 2,4-D is a broad spectrum. So if you see this in the landscape, you may see it on a wide range of plants. Okay, because it can drift to non-target plants. We also have photosynthesis inhibitors, such as atrazine. This affects the older leaves first, and you get leaf yellowing and intervenal chlorosis. And then we have enzyme inhibitors, like glyphosate, that we're all familiar with. And here we get yellowing and browning of leaves. Which, and this doesn't always occur real rapidly. Sometimes it will take a little while before we see those symptoms on the glyphosate uh, sprayed leaves. There are other chemicals as well, but again, this is something you would refer to your coordinator, your educator. The picture on the left is chlorothalonil damage. Chlorothalonil is a fungicide. The columbine on the right has copper damage. Uh, copper spray damage. When there is copper spray damage, it almost always causes a purpling. So we can see things like leaf spots, chlorosis, necrosis, leaf curling, leaf stunting, lots of different symptoms. Uh, but again, this would be something that you would refer to your coordinator. Okay, the last group I have here is uh, cultural problems, cultural um, causes. And this is mechanical injury. This is actually a pecan tree. It was damaged by a backhoe. And then the homeowners painted it with silver paint. But uh, we can get anything from minor damage on tree uh, trunks to death of a whole tree. So, and as we know, there's lots of different things that can cause mechanical injury. Um, everything from vehicles to lawnmowers to golf balls to animals, construction damage, etc. This is one of my favorite slides, um, and it's not so much that it's mechanical injury, it just shows you that. Um, when we look at some of these problems on our plants, we always think, oh my gosh, um, my plant will never be able to respond uh, or to uh, recover from some of these events. But we all know that trees are uh, very persistent. They've been here for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so in this case, a boy went to war in 1914, left his bike chained to the tree, and, um, and here it is. Um, I think this picture is uh, several years old, but it's one of my favorites. And it just helps us to remember that trees can be resilient. Uh, mechanical injury. Uh, the, here they were doing some road 
construction, um, expanding the road perhaps. Um, and the tree up there in the upper right hand corner looks fine. We Right now we can't see the leaves or the top of the tree, but we think, oh gosh, it's fine. May look fine next year, may look fine the year after. And then after a couple of years, you may see symptoms of uh, problems start, you know, small leaves, yellowing, branch breakage, etc. And it all goes back to um, when the construction was done and the roots were severed. So we do not always see this for several years. Here's mechanical injury again. The one on the right is, or left, excuse me, is due to disc golf. And of course, the one on the right, somebody wrapped their tree, uh, wrapped their car into that tree. There's their bumper. Um, and so sometimes some of these injuries can look an awful lot like other things like in some cases, uh, like the one that I just showed you with the construction damage, sometimes you may think it's a water deficit. Maybe you think it's a root disease, bark beetle injury, wind damage. So sometimes, again, when you're trying to diagnose these, you have to look at the history of the plant, the soil, all of those factors when you're trying to come up with what has really caused the damage. I won't go on long about this one because I know as master gardeners you're very familiar with this and it's girdling roots. Um, certainly can be due to poor production methods, soil compaction, excessive mulch, uh, improper planting sites, planting, etc. Um, we also know we see girdling due to tree stakes, wiring, all those things. Um, so what this does is it actually compresses the conductive tissue and, le and, and can lead to trunk decay. So it limits the trunk growth and can compromise the actual structural strength of the tree. In the case of something like this, we might see slow growth, poor color, premature fall color, and in some cases, even the trees are not anchored well in the soil. So trees that are fast growing and tap rooted tend to be more susceptible to girdling roots. This would be something like your elms, your Norways and red maples, oaks and pines. Okay, a couple of other cultural problems. Again, I won't go into this in detail, but uh, just a reminder that changing the soil grade, adding a foot of soil on the top of a, a tree we know is not good. Soil compaction, poor soil drainage, um, a tree that's planted too deeply, um, and excessive mulching. I don't know why, but as I've gone around the state this year, I think we have a an epidemic of uh, volcano mulching. I've seen more this year than I've seen in any other year. And I and I think that one of these nights I'm going to put on a costume and go out with a shovel in Champaign-Urbana and see if I can get rid of some of this excess mulch. Here's just a couple things. Uh, plant traits that resemble abiotic disorders. You may get questions on the helpline about this. Um, people get very upset and think that um, these are things, oh, I've got a, a disease or I've got a problem on my tree, whereas sometimes these are normal things like leaf senescence. We are seeing the conifers losing their interior needles now. They're turning yellow. They're dropping their interior needles, which are the oldest needles, and this is very normal. Um, so uh, sometimes people mistake variegated or blotched leaves uh, as some type of genetic disorder, but uh, we know that oftentimes these are not problems. Um, something that's variegated like a holly or a euonymus, this is not, a, it's a plant trait, it's not a plant problem. Uh, we see corky flaking bark. We see lichens. You're all familiar with that. That's up in the upper right-hand corner. This is a combination of a fungus and an algae. Uh, and it uh, typically grows on the moist side of the tree, the more shaded side of the tree. 
and it is a symbiotic relationship. It does not cause plant disease. And then down in the center screen is a picture of fasci fasciation, which is um, an abnormal flattening of the stems. It's caused by cell mutations, and the stems actually appear fused. They don't know what this is, but it does not seem to cause a lot of problems on plants. And then the last um, slide I have, or the one that um, people ask me quite frequently about, is plant burls. Burls are different than galls. Um, galls are typically caused by insects or diseases, but burls are not um, usually caused by an infectious agent. The cause of them is truly not known. But what actually happens is you have this abnormal growth. It's a proliferation of buds. The cells continue to uh, produce buds. They uh, continue to produce shoots. And those do not differentiate into the normal tissue of the trunk of the tree. So you get this, this structure, which is made up of all these buds and all these undifferentiated cells. Now, the distortions in the wood actually can be very popular. People that uh, work with furniture, gun stocks, actually are very happy to get some burled wood. It has a real nice, uh, um, they, they like the, the look of it. Uh, these types of burls are often found on elms, uh, white birch, honey locust, maple, oak, and redwood. All right, um, I'm going to, that's all I have today. Um, and so we will open it up to questions. I think um, we have a question here. Would the Department of Ag investigate residential chemical drift? And the answer is yes. Um, was there any benefit to painting the backhoe damage on the pecan tree with silver paint? Not that I'm aware of, no. It's, ve it's very difficult. Uh, people always, you know, it's back to that tree paint. People always want, it's like putting a Band-Aid on a sore, you know. Uh, I'm, I've been working on my husband for years. Oh, I've got to put some tree paint on there. And I say, no, you don't have to put tree paint. So the, I see no reason why the silver paint would do any good with the backhoe damage. Other questions?